you slip on over there, he'll be by the choir loft and uh, he'll pray with you and for you. I think that's about all the announcements I have. And with that, I'd love to share with you our theme verse and then I'll get to the invocation. Our theme verse is from Matthew 28, 5 and 6 and it reads, Do not be afraid, for I know that you seek Jesus who was crucified. He is not here, for he has risen as he said. Come, see the place where he lay. That's from Matthew 28, verse 5 and 6. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his mercy endures forever. Christ is risen from the dead. Out of my distress I called on the Lord. The Lord answered me and set me free. Christ is risen from the dead. Hallelujah. The Lord is on my side. I will not fear. Because he lives, he shall live also. The Lord is on my side as my helper. I shall look in triumph on those who hate me. Because he lives, he shall live also. The Lord is my strength and my song. He has become my salvation. Because he lives, we shall live also. I shall not die, but I shall live and recount the deeds of the Lord. Because he lives, we shall live also. The, store that the, the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. Christ is risen from the dead. Hallelujah. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. Christ is risen from the dead. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Christ has risen from the dead. Hallelujah. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good and his mercy endures forever. Amen.
On this day, we celebrate Christ's resurrection from the grave, but we also remember why he went to the grave. We acknowledge that our sins were the reason for his suffering and death, and so we confess those sins to God and seek his mercy. Most merciful God, it is our sins that put Jesus on the cross. It is because of our transgressions that his lifeless body was placed in the tomb. We confess our guilt and acknowledge the gravity of our sin. For the sake of Christ, crucified and risen from the dead, forgive our iniquity and restore us to righteousness. The power of the resurrection enable us to walk in newness of life to the glory of your holy name. We cry to you for mercy. God's Word declares that Jesus was delivered up for our trespasses and raised for our justification. In the mercy of Almighty God, His Son, Jesus Christ, was given to die for you. For Christ's sake, God forgives you all your sins and justifies you, making you holy in His sight. His mercy endures forever because His love for you is steadfast. Amen. Amen. Please be seated as we continue with our special music. <clears throat>
we pray. Gracious Father, as we celebrate the resurrection of our Lord, we do so in view of your mercy. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, you have defeated death and opened to us the way to everlasting life. We thank you that his victory over sin, death, and hell is shared with us so that we become more than conquerors through him who loved us. In view of your mercy, form us by your Spirit to live as newborn children of God. We pray these things in the holy name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Continue with our service song of praise. I'm feeling 
The Old Testament reading for this Easter Sunday comes from Exodus chapter 15. Then Moses and the people of Israel sang this song to the Lord, saying, I will sing to the Lord, for he has triumphed gloriously. The horse and his rider he has thrown into the sea. The Lord is my strength and my song, and he has become my salvation. This is my God, and I will praise him. My Father's God, and I will exalt him. The Lord is a man of war. The Lord is his name. Pharaoh's chariots and his host he cast into the sea, and his chosen officers were sunk in the Red Sea. The floods covered them. They went down into the depths like a stone. Your right hand, O Lord, glorious in power. Your right hand, O Lord, shatters the enemy. In the greatness of your majesty, you overthrow your adversaries. You send out your fury. It consumes them like stubble. At the blast of your nostrils, the waters piled up. The flood stood up in a heap, and the deeps congealed in the heart of the sea. The enemy said, I will pursue, I will overtake, I will divide the spoil. My desire shall have its fill of them. I will draw my sword, my hand shall destroy them. You blew with your wind, the sea covered them. They sank like lead in the mighty waters. Who is like you, O Lord, among the other gods? Who is like you, majestic in holiness, awesome in glorious deeds, doing wonders? You stretched out your right hand. The earth swallowed them. You have led in your steadfast love the people whom you have redeemed. You have guided them by your strength to your holy abode. This is the word of the Lord. The epistle reading comes from the sixth chapter of Romans, verses 3 through 11. Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death, in order that, just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. We know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. For one who has died has been set free from sin. Now, if we have died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. We know that Christ, being raised from the dead, will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death he died, he died to sin, once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. So you also must consider yourself dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please rise as you are able for the reading of the Holy Gospel. The Holy Gospel according to Matthew, the 28th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Now after the Sabbath toward the dawn of the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to see the tomb. And behold, there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning and his clothing white as snow. And for fear of him, the guards trembled and became like dead men. But the angel said to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know that you seek Jesus who was crucified. He is not here, for he has risen as he said. Come, see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples that he has risen from the dead, and behold, he is going before you to Galilee. There you will see him. See, I have told you. So they departed quickly from the tomb with fear and great joy and ran to tell the disciples. And behold, Jesus met them and said, Greetings. And they came up and took hold of his feet and worshipped him. Then Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee, and there they will see me. This is the gospel of the Lord. Glory to you, Lord Christ. 
Please be seated, boys and girls. I would invite you to come forward now for a special message that Pastor Circle has prepared. Jesus asked her. She thought it was the gardener that worked 
around there. So she said to him, if you took Jesus' body away, please tell me where he is so I can go and see him. Jesus looked right at her and said, Mary. She turned to look up at the man properly and saw that it was Jesus right there. He was left amazed. She said to him, Rabboni. She went up to help Jesus, but he said, Go right now and tell my disciples that I am alive. So Mary went all around and told the disciples all about what had happened right there at the tomb. She was left to tell everyone she had gone down to the tomb and had seen Jesus alive. We know that this story right here is being told all around the world today. It's not a story that has been made up or written down just for fun. We know the story is the true story of God's love for us. We are forgiven right now, and we are loved right now. We are never left alone, and we always get to go around and tell this great story. Christ is risen.
Alleluia. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. In a cemetery in Hanover, Germany, there is a tomb which is known as the Opened Grave. It is the tomb of a noble woman, Henry Edda von Ruling, who died in 1782. Her gravestone is immense and constructed of heavy stone with a large and imposing tombstone resting on it. And the stone bears an inscription which says, This tomb, bought for eternity, may never be opened. Again, I repeat, This tomb, bought for eternity, may never be opened. In spite of this inscription, Frau Henriette's strongly fortified tomb has in fact been opened. And after her burial, a birch tree germinated at the base slab of the monument and over the years grew taller, larger, and wider, and slowly but surely and steadily. The tree's roots and trunk forced its way and raised the tombstone and opened the grave. So despite the claim of the inscription to never be open, the tomb is now known as the opened grave. The inscription forbidding entrance into the tomb speaks in vain above a yawning crypt. So, almost 2,000 years ago, another tomb is made as secure as possible. We remember just outside the city, of Jerusalem. Every precaution is taken to prevent entrance into it. The tomb has been hewn within solid stone and a heavy boulder is placed over its opening as the scriptures say. A detachment of soldiers is placed at the gravesite in order to protect against any, any tampering. And finally a seal bearing the authority of the government is stretched across the entrance to prevent any movement even of the boulder. And undoubtedly, it is as secure as a tomb could be. And yet, only 36 hours later, that Palestinian tomb has been secured. It is discovered open. And the boulder is rolled away from the crypt's entrance. The guards are gone, nowhere to be found. The seal lays broken on the ground. And most significant of all, the lifeless body, also entombed, is missing. All the security precautions of the day have been in vain. The grave is now empty. And the fact that the tomb of Jesus of Nazareth is empty takes everyone by surprise. It surprises the women who arrive at the tomb early on Sunday morning. The believing women of the day, expecting to anoint Jesus' dead body. And it surprises the soldiers, who probably were unbelievers, who knows, who earlier have considered it foolish to guard a dead man's tomb. But now they also tremble and become like dead men. And most of all, it surprises the priests who thereafter fabricate a story to explain the missing body. It even surprises Jesus' disciples, of course, believers, who stubbornly refuse to believe the startling news of the resurrection. Everyone is surprised at this dramatic turn of the events at which Jesus rises from the dead. So in this surprising turn of events, the empty tomb of Jesus Christ, God snatches victory from the jaws of defeat. His great mercy to his beloved people is demonstrated in the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. But this isn't the first time that God has waged a startling last-minute victory. The Old Testament reading from Exodus 15 depicts another battle scene. The Israelites are fleeing the oppressive Egyptians but become trapped. Pharaoh's chariots and warriors have surrounded God's people, I always say, in the back of them. And of course, the turbulent Red Sea restricts their retreat on the other side, which I say is in front of them, we'll just say. 
And before Pharaoh gives the command for his army to swoop in for the slaughter, he gloats over the impending victory. He says, I'm going to be in victory even before the battle begins. He says, I will pursue, I will overtake, I will divide the spoil. My desire shall have its fill of them. I will draw my sword, my hand shall destroy them. And yet, in what seems like inevitable success for the enemy, God works a surprise. In the face of the utter defeat for God's people, the Lord pulls off a victory. He makes the sea into dry land, as Exodus puts it. The waters piled up, the flood stood up in a heap. And in God's great surprise, he delivers his people to safety by enabling them to escape to the other side of the sea on dry land. And God destroys his opponents as the Egyptians pursue God's people through the causeway. Jehovah's restraining hand is removed. The walls of water collapse on the Egyptians, drowning them all. In the surprising turn of events at the Red Sea, God snatches victory from the jaws of defeat, and his great mercy to his beloved people is demonstrated by delivering them through the sea. And then we have centuries later, the enemy once again boasts of victory. Like Pharaoh of old, Satan gloats over his conquest at the cross. He was there at the cross when Jesus dies. And his body is laid in the tomb. Satan and his demons celebrate in heaven their apparent triumph. The prince of darkness thinks he has delivered the final victorious blow against Jesus when his body is laid in the grave. He who has the power of death, the devil, seems to have successfully wielded that power against Jesus. But then the God of surprises turns the tables on Satan. And while in the very clutches of death and hell, Jesus overcomes death and hell. And the apparent victim becomes the true victor. He who is dead now is alive again. The Apostle Peter declares to those who have witnessed Jesus' crucifixion, God raised him up, loosing the pains of death because it was not possible for him to be held by death. And Satan does his utmost to shackle Jesus in death, to keep him permanently in his grip. But when Christ has completely disarmed the devil, he bursts forth triumphantly from death's ancient prison of hell. Jesus emerges victorious, proclaiming, I died, and behold, I am alive forevermore, and I have the keys of death and Hades. That's from Revelation chapter 1, verse 18. In this surprising turn of events in the spiritual realm, God snatches victory from the jaws of defeat. His great mercy to his beloved people is demonstrated in the conquest over sin and Satan and death itself. But the most wondrous surprise of it all is the fact that God's victory is ours also. Christ shares his Easter victory over death with us. And God's victory over Pharaoh at the Red Sea means deliverance for his people Israel. Today, God's ultimate victory over Satan means deliverance for us. God's surprise comes when he uses the waters of the Red Sea to deliver his people and destroy his enemy. And that surprise continues on today when he uses the water of holy baptism to deliver us from the grasp of Satan and from the grasp of sin. St. Paul describes this. We were buried therefore with him by baptism into death in order that, just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. 
For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. Christ's resurrection is not only history or his story, but it is our story as well. As baptized believers in Christ, we can share an identity with Christ in his death and resurrection. And just as death no longer has dominion over Jesus, so it no longer terrorizes us who are in Christ by faith. We no longer are condemned by sin since its penalty, death, has been paid for by the risen Lord. Therefore, we are members of Christ's body. We are members of his universal church. We share in his conquest over death. And we do it all by the mercy of God. We are the beneficiaries of his victory over the forces of darkness. When Jesus emerges alive from the abyss of death and lays claim to the keys of Hades, he does so for our salvation and future resurrection. And by his mercy, we share in his everlasting triumph. So in this surprising turn of events of Easter, God shares his eternal victory with us. His great mercy to his beloved people is the fact that he makes us co-heirs with Christ of the resurrection life. A true story. On Easter morning, seven-year-olds gathered for Sunday school, and the teacher narrated the story of Jesus' resurrection in order to engage the students. The teacher asked them this question. What do you think was Jesus' first word when he came out of the tomb alive? And the little girl raises her hand, and the teacher calls on her. And the girl jumps to her feet, and she stretches out her hands, and she shouts, surprise! <laughs> Jesus' first word was surprise. This child understands the essence of Easter. It is God's greatest surprise. It is his victory surprise. And because Christ rose on Easter, Jesus will one day raise us from the dead in that final jubilant surprise. Amen. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah. I would invite you to stand once again as you are able and let us boldly confess our faith according to the words of the Nicene Creed. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried and the third day he rose again according to the scriptures and ascended to heaven and sits at the right hand of God. He will come again in glory to judge both the living and the dead whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. And we pray. Risen Christ, we rejoice at your victory over sin. United with you in baptism, may we consider ourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. Lord, in your mercy. Living Lord, we celebrate your triumph over death as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father. 
May we walk in newness of life, especially those who are ill and grieving. And so we pray for Dusty Shapley, uh, praying for his healing and also that he did good test results, they'd be negative. For Sue Brendan, recuperating from cancer surgery, and Adeline Silliman, recuperating from eye surgery, and Eileen Onken, recuperating from foot surgery. We pray for Carol Kinnett, who's recuperating from melanoma surgery. We're thankful that, and praying for Mark Shapiro for his tests that he had and his esophagus, and for Ellie Poppany, who was hospitalized and received treatments. We remember those who are grieving, the family of Eric Erickson, brother of Alex Erickson, the family of Alan Kellen, uncle of Jennifer Lake, and the family of Bill Van Dyke. Lord, in your mercy, victorious deliverer, we acclaim your defeat of the devil. Trusting in your declaration of justification, may we live in freedom from the accusation of guilt. Lord, in your mercy. Loving Redeemer, we affirm your rescue for of us from hell. May we never fear the grave or what follows, but eagerly anticipate our own resurrection and life everlasting. Lord, in your mercy. Mighty Conqueror, we hail you as King of kings and Lord of lords. May we serve you in holiness and righteousness all the days of our lives and into eternity, especially as we recognize milestone birthdays of Jill Nelson, Mary Federson, and Carol Heyman. Lord, in your mercy. In view of your mercy, move us by your spirit to face death with hope in the sure and certain promise of life everlasting through the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Alleluia, Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia, amen. As Christ has taught us, we are bold to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night in which he was betrayed, took bread, and when he gave thanks, he broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat, this is my body which is given for you, this do in remembrance of me. In the same manner also he took the cup after supper, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you, this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for you, and the New Covenant, which is shed for you, for the full forgiveness of all your sins. This do as often as you drink it, in remembrance of me. You may be seated as we continue with the distribution.
may this, the true body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, strengthen and preserve you in true faith unto life everlasting, departing God's peace. Amen. Gracious God, our Heavenly Father, you have given us a foretaste of the feast to come in the Holy Supper of your Son's body and blood. Keep us firm in the true faith throughout our days of pilgrimage, that on the day of his coming, we may, together with all your saints, celebrate the marriage feast of the Lamb in his kingdom, which has no end. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. May the God of peace, who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus Christ, the great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the eternal covenant, equip you with every good that you may do his will, working in us that which is pleasing in his sight, through Jesus Christ, to whom be the glory forever and ever. Amen. Our service concludes with, I know that my Redeemer lives, and I would invite you to stand as you are able as we sing out joyously.